Amy Goodman. It's been nearly 40 years since Henry Kissinger left office. But his influence on the national security state can still be widely felt as the United States engages in declared and undeclared wars across the globe. Kissinger served as national security advisor and secretary of state in the Nixon and Ford administrations and helped revive a militarized version of American exceptionalism. During his time in office, Henry Kissinger oversaw a massive expansion of the war in Vietnam and the secret bombings of Laos and Cambodia. In Latin America, declassified documents show how Kissinger secretly intervened across the continent, from Bolivia to Uruguay to Chile to Argentina. In Chile, Kissinger urged President Nixon to take a, quote, harder line against Chile's democratically elected president, Salvador Allende. On September 11, 1973, another September 11, Allende was overthrown by the U.S.-backed general Augusto Pinochet. In Jakarta, Indonesia, Kissinger and President Gerald Ford met with the Indonesian dictator, General Suharto, to give the go-ahead to invade East Timor, which Indonesia did on December 7, 1975. The Indonesians killed a third of the Timorese population. Kissinger also drew up plans to attack Cuba in the mid-70s, after Fidel Castro sent Cuban forces into Angola to fight forces linked to apartheid South Africa. White human rights activists have long called for, well, human rights activists have long called for Kissinger to be tried for war crimes. He remains a celebrated figure in Washington and beyond. Joining us now is Greg Grandin, author of the new book Kissinger's Shadow: The Long Reach of America's Most Controversial Statesman. Well, Greg Grandin is a professor of Latin American history at New York University. His previous books include Fortlandia, The Rise and Fall of Henry Ford's Forgotten Jungle City, The Empire of Necessity, Slavery, Freedom and Deception in the New World, and Empire's Workshop. We welcome you back to Democracy Now!, Professor. Um, Greg, why did you take on Kissinger? I felt like that, um, to a large degree, he's gotten away with it, right? He's 92 years old. And there's been a rehabilitation of, of, of Henry Kissinger and supposedly what he stands for, not just by the political right, but by the across the political establishment. Hillary Clinton uh, embraced Kissinger last year in a review in the Washington Post of his last book. Samantha Power went to a Boston Red Sox Yankee game with him, and they, the they US had ambassador yeah, to the United yeah, Nations. liberal hawk who who wrote and who came to who, who who made her name writing about genocides, including three genocides that Kissinger is implicated in, and they came together at a Yankee Red Sox game and banded. I feel like there's a there's a way in which Kissinger uh, embodies the national security state. Now let me say. Obviously, there's there's a there's another crit critique of Henry Kissinger based on all of the acts. You know, Henry, Christopher Hitchens' famous book, *The Trial of Henry Kissinger*, and I think that that's useful. But I think focusing on Kissinger as a war criminal misses the large his larger importance in the endurance of the national security state and the and the continuity from Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos to Iraq and beyond. Explain what you mean. What what exactly does it miss? Well, I think there's ways in which Kissinger came to power, took office in 1969 at a, at a very at a very vulnerable moment for the national security state. The old imperial presidency was 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 giving way, was cracking up. That post-war consensus that had governed the country from the 1940s through 1966 was breaking apart as a result of Vietnam, as a result of of, of economic issues and race issues in the United States. And Kissinger was 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 very instrumental in. In, in figuring out, not only presiding and in some ways accelerating that crack up, because certainly the bombing of Cambodia and all of his uh, um, uh, all of his illegal activities that 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 furthered polarization f hastened hastened the, the unraveling of that cons consensus. But but I think it was also instrumental in in, in reestablishing the national security state on on new footing in order to move forward in a in a in a, in a in a, um, to a post-Vietnam War, in three ways in particular. One, um, I think that he, um, he's, he's instrumental in reestablishing covert activities and clandestine activities and figuring out ways to bypass a lot of the focus that reporters, critical reporters such as yourself and Alan Hahn and, and, and a critical Congress began to place on the presidency. I think you can see a continuity between what he was doing in Southern Africa, for instance, supporting, um, in, using 
third-party mercenaries in order to wage an illegal war with what comes later under Reagan, Iran-Contra. Um, I think he's very important in, in, um, in emphasizing the need for spectacular actions in order to demonstrate credibility, but not just credibility to the world, credibility to, um, to a war-weary citizen at, ho at home. I think him and Nixon are also very good at, um, at, at leveraging domestic dissent and polarization <laughs> and using militarism and war in order to for political gain at home. And so we all know about Nixon's Southern strategy, an attempt to win over Southern Democrats by playing to racism at home. In some ways, what Nixon and Kissinger did in Laos and Cambodia was the foreign policy of the Southern strategy. Kissinger would go and, and use the fact that they were bombing a country to destruction to placate, you know, like blood tribute to a rising new right, and go to Ronald Reagan as president, as governor of California and said, well, Look what we're doing. We wouldn't have had Laos. We wouldn't have had Cambodia if, if, if we don't have Nixon as a way of kind of paying tribute to that militaristic right. Let's go to Henry Kissinger in his own words. The average person thinks that morality can be applied as directly to the conduct of states to each other as it can to human relations. That is not always the case, because sometimes statesmen have to choose among evils. That's an archival interview of Henry Kissinger featured in the documentary The Trials of Henry Kissinger. Well, that quotes like that, when, when Kissinger's talking about the need to downplay and, and not use morality or idealism in foreign policy, is often uh, used to mistakenly describe him as a realist. Or, or a believe in real politique. But one of the things that I argue is that if we take realism as a, as a, as a belief that, that the material world exists, that, that, um, that the truth of that world is evident in the facts of that world, and Kissinger is not a realist. He comes out of a certain kind of German, irrational kind of will to power idealism. He's very much influenced by German metaphysicians such as uh, Oswaldo Spengler, such as Immanuel Kant, that believe that human beings actually don't have access to reality, that they that that, that their understanding of, of reality comes through their action. Now, how that relates to foreign policy is that Kessinger is open, and, he, and this is something that he's been saying since the 1950s forward, that one has to act in the world, that one has to act in the world in order for one to have an understanding of the world, that he's taught us that great powers are, are, are always gaining or losing influence, and then one has to, one has to, um, one has to basically create reality. You qu uh, quote him from 1963. I'm sure you know this quote by yeah, heart. It's the, well, it's the, yeah, well, I don't know by heart. You, you get read. <laughs> there are two kinds of realists, those who manipulate facts and those who create them. The West requires nothing so much as men able to create their own reality. Yeah, now just think, fast forward to the, to the, to the 2000s, and, and the Bush administration came, roundly came under criticism when one of its staff is that it's now believed to be Karl Rove said that we're an empire now. We, we, when we act, we create reality. And that was taken as an example of neocon hubris and neocon arrogance, a certain kind of irrational idealism that believes that reality is created through military power. And oftentimes Kissinger is set up as, as the opposite of that, as a sober realist. But the fact is that he's not. It's true that the first generation of neocons, Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz, came up attacking Kissinger. They thought he was a, a loser for Vietnam and a pisa for detente and a sinner because he didn't believe in American idealism. But the fact of the matter is that Kissinger kind of lays the groundwork for their extreme subjectivism. You can see a, a strong continuity between, for example, Dick Cheney's 1% doctrine, where he says that we can't wait for all the evidence to become, we have to treat a 1% uh, intelligence as if it was 100% certainty, and that's a justification for why we have a, a warrant to go into Iraq, to go into Afghanistan, to go into wherever. Kissinger said all of that 40 years ago. And Kissinger, what's, which, what's unique about Kissinger is that every other post-war realist George Kennan, Hans Morgenthau, Arthur Schlesinger, be they liberal or conservative, at some point breaks with the national security state over Vietnam, over the arms buildup. Kissinger, with every lurch to the right, he lurches with it. He, he moves from Rockefeller, a liberal Republican, to Nixon, bad of an eye, from Nixon to Reagan, from Reagan to the neocons. And so I don't think that Nick, I don't think Kissinger is 
creates the national security states, but I think his long career illustrates it and, and, and shines a light on it like, like nobody else. Earlier this year, activists with the anti-war group Code Pink <laughs> attempted to perform a citizen's arrest of Henry Kissinger when he arrived to testify on global security challenges at a Senate Armed Services Committee meeting in January. Let's go to a clip. Senator John McCain lashed out at the protesters and called on the Capitol Hill police to remove them. I've been a member of this committee for many years, and I have never seen anything as disgraceful and outrageous and despicable as the last demonstration that just took place about, you know, you're going to have to shut up or I'm going to have you arrested. Get out of here, you low-life scum. So said Senator John McCain. Thirty minutes later, two more members of Code Pink interrupted Kissinger's testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Yet as we look around the world, we encounter upheaval and conflict and chaos. Code Pink calls for the arrest of Henry Kissinger for war crimes. Vietnam, for 1969. The protests at the Senate Armed Services Committee testimony of Henry Kissinger. Greg Grandin. Well, just the fact that he's still being called to give testimony. I mean, you can look at one disaster after another. Cambodia, Southern Africa, he, he instigated inser counterinsurgencies in Angola and Mozambique that cost the lives of millions of people, what he did in Latin America. Um, you have students, so you know when you say, well, this is obvious, it's a long career. Many people really know nothing about this history. They know in Latin America, them. explain. Well, in Latin America, he supported Operation Condor. He he was instrumental in, in organizing the coup in, in not just in Chile, in Bolivia. He was involved in Uruguay and Argentina. He either you know he he, he provided moral legitimacy, or he was actually involved in in, um, in in the destabilization campaigns that led to coups. And then once once the region fell to a right wing anti anti communist. Governments, he was his. He was instrumental in in supporting um, Operation Condor, which was a kind of transnational consortium of death squads that carried out a, a, a international terrorist. That was campaign. broader than Chile. Yeah, that was broader than Chile. It was broader than Latin America. And why did he support Pinochet in the coup against the democratically elected leader Salvador Allende? Well, in general, because Salvador Allende was a was a Marxist, but he was an, a, an elected Marxist and a democratic elected Marxist, and this and this and this indication that that Allende scared Kissinger more than somebody like Castro did. Because Castro came, kept power not through elections, so he was easy, easily, easily dismissed or contained as a dictator. Uh, it, Kissinger's fear was that Allende um, would actually allow for a transference of power and thus kind of complicate this bipolar wor world between, between, between the Soviet Union and the United States. I wanted to go for a moment to another clip. Um, this is a clip of a uh, well-known uh, TV personality who is coming back on the air uh, in just a few days. Um, this is uh, Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert, who is dancing in Kissinger's office. Security.
That was Kissinger calling security, but, of course, it was all a joke. Yeah, and I think that's part of the rehabilitation, the transformation of somebody implicated and, and responsible directly or indirectly in a number of genocides and mass murder, turning her into an avuncular kind of comic figure that we can we can make fun of. I mean, I, at the same time, people like Samantha Power and Hillary Clinton, they seek out his advice and they, they banter with him. And I think it's it's ritualistic. It's a, it's a way of a kind of invoking purpose or invoking gravitas. I think that things have gotten so bad in the foreign policy establishment and things have gotten so bad for U.S. US strategy abroad that, that there's a nostalgia for what Kissinger represents, but nobody really quite re knows what Kissinger represents. He kind of represents purpose. But what I try to argue about in the book is that, th that there's a hollowness to the purpose that leads to a circularity of escalation, causing more escalation, causing more escalation. And His involvement in Israel-Palestine. He w well, he was deeply involved in the Middle East, particularly after the, after the U.S. was was defeated in in, um, in 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 Southeast Asia, and he was instrumental in kind of locking in the impasse. There are historians that that write about this. Rashid Khalid talks about how Kissinger kind of locks in the current stalemate. He he get he 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 commits the United States not to recognize uh, uh, Palestine until Palest until Palestinian Authority recognizes the the, the, the legitimate of Israel but he, he, he doesn't he doesn't demand any such he doesn't demand any such conditions on on the support the US US gives to Israel but beyond Israel Palestine his support for the Shah his support for in Saudi Iran. In, in Iran prior to the revolution, using sh in kind of the, the the duopoly of Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran prior to the revolution as guardians of the Gulf, was disastrous. Um, Kissinger's kind of using petrodollars, the ri increasing rise of oil prices, energy energy costs, funneling it back into the U.S. defense industry and selling weapons to the Shah. Anything he wanted, the Shah got. Anything Saudi Arabia wanted, Saudi Arabia got. Um, it's it's kind of created the infrastructure of permanent crisis that we see in the Middle East. You know, when we think about the rise of the Mujahideen in the 1970s, in the 1980s against the, against the Soviet Union, we tend to focus on the CIA's support for what eventually becomes al-Qaeda. But back, it's back in the 1970s where Kissinger, Kissinger you, urges Pakistan to move into Afghanistan, to start to, start to destabilize that country as a way of a pawn in the Cold War. Do you think Henry Kissinger should be tried as a war criminal? We have 20 seconds. Yes, obviously. But I also think that we should we should also understand beyond that there's ways in which the, the language of pr pr prosecution and war crimes kind of um, kind of uh, eclipse a deeper historical understanding. And if we want to get out of, if we want to understand the mess we're in now, we have to beyond just a kind of language of moral outrage and, and understand Kissinger's, Kissinger's role in, in rehabilitating the national security state. Greg Grand, and I want to thank you for being with us, professor of Latin American history at New York University. His new book, Kissinger's Shadow, The Long Reach of America's Most Controversial Statesman. That